Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Two Opinionated, where this is a pretty big one for me. Today, I'm joined by founder, owner, MLB Trade Rumors, Tim Durkis. So welcome, Tim. Thanks for having me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty excited. I, uh, I, I don't get to talk uh, baseball nearly. And, and now, my wife would say I get to talk it way <laughs> too much, but not nearly enough, in my opinion. <laughs> So, so Tim, let's let's start this way, and I, I know you've told this story a, a few times, but uh, give us a little idea of your your background. You know, what gave you the idea to kind of go into to a baseball app, and and how did the MLB trade rumors come about? Sure. All right. So, um, I, I've always been a big baseball fan, Cubs fan, growing up. Um, Sorry. So, uh, a lot of very <laughs> unsuccessful teams, you know, they would make the playoffs a handful of times during my entire life. Um, and then so uh, I went to University of Illinois and then um, after college, um, I, I started a job in Chicago in search engine marketing. And yeah. I had, um, I would talk, talk baseball a lot with coworkers and there was a certain coworker, Jeff, uh, who suggested I start a fantasy baseball blog. Um, this was in 2005. And so I, I said, yeah, I guess that sounds like a good idea. I don't really know why he thought I should <laughs> do that. You know, I didn't know what a blog was, um, but I like writing, you know, and I certainly like talking about that stuff. And I like, yeah. I like baseball stats and kind of playing fantasy and, and nerdy stuff like that. And so I started the fantasy baseball uh, blog and it, it did okay. You know, my, my, the bar was really low. I just, if I saw a thousand people <laughs> within the day, it was, that was so cool, you know? That's still, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. There wasn't any kind of, um, big expectations there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so, um, I, I remember doing like a top 50 free agents or something for, for the 06 season or something like that. And, um, I realized that a lot of the stuff I wanted to write about was starting to spill over, to where it didn't have much fancy application. Um, it was more, you know, the hot stove, which is something that's always been of interest to me. Um, and it happened at the time that, you know, around say like 06 or so, um, there wasn't really a website or too many places where you could go and get that news all in one place and get it kind of in real time. Um, there were, uh, fantasy baseball things you could do that for right and, uh, those are still going strong like roto world or roto wire um but in terms of you know the full focus on the hot stove and free agency and not just like the signing happened but that whatever was rumored out there because even then ken rosenthal was just absolutely going nuts with rumors and putting stuff <laughs> up and if it was 2006 and you wanted to kind of be be up on rosenthal uh there was no twitter um, That's right. There was RSS feeds, and then there was going to Fox Sports and hitting F five and just seeing when something new might pop up. So there's no real way to be notified that Ken or the other 200 baseball writers had posted new information. So I kind right. of took it upon myself to uh, aggregate or curate all that info in one spot, um, and that's what I did. And so. Once I started doing that with MLB Trade Rumors, um, and I would put the I would put the link on my fantasy site. So the fantasy site was small, but you know it still had hundreds or maybe a thousand people visiting it every day. And so that was the spark that lit the flame, and that was what caused MLB Trade Rumors to kind of take off. And it passed up the fantasy site pretty quickly. Um, so I, I realized that MLB Trade Rumors was the horse that I needed to be betting on. Um, so I slowly transitioned away from the fantasy stuff and started to do you know the mlb stuff and kept it up every day and i would take off work for like the trade deadline and stuff just so that i would be um you know all over those really busy days or the winter meetings and stuff like that um and then i so i quit my job in 2008. yeah good for you yeah that's, that's yeah. pretty awesome so that's huge, the dream huge moment for me you know <laughs> and i remember coworkers saying this isn't going to work. X percent of small businesses fail. And, you know, and I liked that job and I really liked yeah. um, my coworkers. It was a really good place to work. Um, 
but still, you know, the chance to do this was even more appealing. Yeah, I, I, that's such it's such a great story. So when you know, was there a moment that you knew, hey, this this is going to work, or you know, did did you get a, a notice from one of the writers that would be like, hey, you know, did did stuff start to happen that caused you to think, hey, this is going to work, or was it just a matter of um, the viewership that was coming in? Yeah, I think it was the the gradual buildup of the traffic. Um, yeah. So I certainly watched the traffic, and um, I remember. Um, so I got married in 2006, and I kind of remember um, me and my wife financing like the entire wedding from MLB <laughs> Trade Rumors money. So maybe it made like, you know, I don't know, 10 grand or something. Yeah. And I was like, wow, we could pay for a whole wedding. Um, you know, we don't have to try to ask our parents for any money or anything. And so it's like, oh, that was that was kind of like a. I was like, wow, this is a really nice hobby to have that that I could make 10 right. grand from it. Um, but eventually, MLB Trade Rumors, um, you know, each each time there was like a major traffic event, we would take a leap forward. So that would be the winter meetings and, and the July trade deadline. So yeah. after a few years, um, I was making as much money through the website as I was through my job. So it's like, OK, so it wasn't like a like a risky leap of faith. It was like this is this is like hitting me over the head with you know, you, this can support you. Um, right. And it's okay to quit your job. And even though you subtract the income from that job, my wife, you know, was working at the time we didn't have kids yet. So um, she, she had the health insurance for us and mm -hmm. we we're able to do it with, with enough of a safety net. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. And that's, that's not a bad way to, to get uh, your wife on board and be like, Hey, this hobby can pay for our wedding. You know, yeah, right? she put up with a lot. She put up with a lot. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that did help sell it. But I remember like my lame marketing efforts and she had to be a part of those. And I remember we went back to visit our old college campus. I remember like marking up the quad with chalk about, about my website <laughs> and stuff. And we probably, I assume, got like three visitors from that effort. But, nope. you know, she went around with me and put up with it. And, you know, it involved a lot of working nights and weekends in addition to a normal job. So, you know, she just kind of dealt with it. I'd be doing, on, you know, during time that we probably should have been hanging out together. So she was a good sport. Yeah, it's pretty good because it's so difficult. You know, we run into that with the podcast. It's so difficult to kind of um, curate viewership, you know, or, or, or just uh, traffic coming coming through. And you have those days where you're looking at it and it might go up two you know you're <laughs> just like i don't think this is ever going to work but then if as you start gaining a little bit of uh, traction it, it's it, it becomes very exciting watching those numbers kind of uh, multiply so that's, yeah one thing i've learned is that it, it it has never been like a straight upward line it has been yeah. unpredictable erratic there's times when i thought the traffic would go up and it didn't and the opposite and there's times where MLB trade rumors traffic plateaued, I think, for three years, you know, yeah. and after three years of seeing like eerily identical traffic year to year, you're like, OK, this is the capacity that the public has for a hot stove <laughs> baseball website. It can never be more. It's been three years and then something will happen, be it Bryce Harper, yeah. and Machado and free agency or whatever the case, they'll take a big old jump and maybe it'll stay up there. And then so, you know, I've kind of seen like these long plateaus and then kind of a somewhat unexpected leap forward. And now with COVID, we took a pretty good step back. And yeah. I feel like we're going to need a few years to kind of get back to where we were in 2019 or who knows, you know, things change, people's interests change. So it's, it's just so unpredictable. Yeah, that, that has to be difficult when you have a, a truncated season that doesn't start till July, basically. Um, you know, there's only so many out, you know, out of season, off season rumors and transactions that you can put on the site. You yeah, know, well, at some they, point you need they, games. Uh, they instituted a freeze. So, you know, normally, normally March is okay for us. 
um, and maybe there's some extensions and some kind of yeah. minor transactions. But in the middle of March, a year ago, they put on a freeze. There's nothing in March. There's nothing at all in April. There's nothing in May. And then so we don't really rely on the games being played to generate interest because we're about the transactions. But, you know, when baseball goes completely dormant from mid-March until, you know, some point in July, um, you know, it was it was scary. It was just like, you know, yeah. the website I thought was somewhat, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say recession proof, but I, I don't think the interest was going to plummet in it, even if maybe the ad rates would go down. I didn't think it could have like a catastrophic event, you know, that would kind of do that because sure. it weathered 08 pretty good. And, you know, I always thought that there's just a base level of baseball fans who want to read this stuff and baseball is always there. And every year the names change, but there's always new trades and free agency to talk about. So we'll just keep talking about that stuff. So that's why I was just like, of course, <laughs> me and everybody else is just out of nowhere. And it just, you know. Yeah, it was a rough year. That was a rough year. So, so what have you always been just a sports fan? What, what gave you the idea to kind of expand it to the other sports? Um, that I would say that was a business move. I am not really a fan of the other sports. I, I love baseball. Um, I would watch football as a very casual fan and, yeah. and basketball and hockey. I really don't. So, um, it was, I think we started Hoops Rumors in 2012. And so the thinking was just that um, we'd kind of created a formula to do this pretty well. Um, and that if we had a large, you know, a large audience and a lot of traffic on the baseball website, some percentage of those people would like to um, see something similar um, of the same quality in other sports. So. You know, that started with uh, with basketball, and we, we just right. kind of try to replicate the same idea. And we have full time employees for each of those websites. Um, and you know, I don't uh, contribute to those, and I don't have editorial insight to those, um, except at like the very highest of levels because I don't follow those sports closely. Yeah, it's it's interesting with basketball and football because they have a lot of transactions in a short, short period of time. You know, it's more condensed than baseball is. Yeah, that's what I've come to learn. And, it's, you know, I was such a, such, I, I knew so little about those sports that when I started those websites, I did not know that. Um, I, and then I've come to realize that baseball has a unique, um, increasingly drawn out off season, yeah. you know, where you can get major deals in March as players are in spring training and, and then you also have, you know, pretty exciting trade deadline. And, you know, in, in football, I, I guess all the signings are done in a week. And yeah. <laughs> trades are kind of not anything, I guess. Right. And, you know, I'm just starting to learn that how different it is. Um, basketball seems like it has a really solid hot stove, though. Yeah. I don't know yeah. Yeah. It's probably closer to baseball. Yeah. It's probably closer to baseball. Yeah. I think that's what, that's kind of what makes baseball unique, though, is because. You know, there's there's as much interest off season as there is in season. You know, for yeah. true baseball fans, they just they they love the transaction side of, you know, yeah. where when I was growing up, you really didn't have those type of transactions. You, you know, players stuck more to one team. So if there was a trade or something, it was usually. Uh, on yeah, the yeah. Baseball. I mean, in the the I've said this before in a couple of interviews, but the Cubs were so bad that. Um, when they would make moves and make changes like that was that every, everything they would do outside of their actual gameplay was probably more interesting than the way they played. So when they would be active in free agency, which they occasionally would, um, that that created hope and and that, and that was fun. And so, you know, you, you start watching them and they could be out of it in a matter of a month, <laughs> which they were. Um, many times. And so, you know, when they were off signing guys and making deals, um, that really sparked my interest kind of as a teenager. Yeah. Did, um, uh, were you a fan based on the fact that it was like Cubs and the Braves were all that was on TV? Um, well, I, uh, I grew up in the Chicago area, so, yep. um, I guess it could have happened in a different area just because of the WGN thing, but, um, 
Yes, uh, WGN was crucial to, I would say, my Cubs fandom and my baseball fandom. And yeah. um, we didn't have cable when I was growing up. And so I wouldn't have had any means to watch baseball. But instead, I had the Cubs on, they were on free, and they were on every, you know, every single day in the afternoon. So it was a very easy thing. And I think it was my mom, you know, who grew up a Cubs fan and kind of, it was just a natural thing to go into being a Cubs fan. Um, but, you know, my parents didn't really push it or anything. It was just something I took an interest in because I liked yeah. playing and I liked watching. Yeah. So did you play ball going, growing up? Yeah. Yeah. I, I loved playing. I still love playing to this day. I play 12-inch um, softball with my friends around yeah. here. Um, I, I really liked playing baseball for the pure joy of it. Right. Um other people's abilities passed me up about sixth grade. And so <laughs> um, that was just the way it was. Um, I, I was an above average player. I had this little window where I was pretty good. Maybe it was third, fourth grade. I, I think I made one all-star team once and I could get some hits and stuff. And then, and then the game kind of passed me by. Yeah. And then um, tried out for the high school team, didn't make it. And um and then, so to keep it going, I uh, I would gather. I worked at Kmart, and I gathered together all my Kmart friends, and we would go out to the, the fields, and we would just play like lob pitch baseball, and it was it was so fun, and it was just as fun as any organized baseball that I ever played. So, I mean, I just I just love to get out there and do it, and it doesn't matter to me, um, you know, that I wasn't good enough to pursue it in high school or whatever. Yeah, that's that's pretty great. I I know when I was growing up and first kind of became a baseball fan, I had uh, a, one buddy um, from down the street, and we would play one on one baseball. Yeah, it's not easy. You got to be creative to pull that off. Yeah. You got to be creative. Well, somehow and, you have to go field it. Well, well, that's it. Like I I would talk him into pitching first every time. And I mean, I don't know that he ever got to bat. You know? yeah. Yeah. You're never going to get that third out. <laughs> so, so you're coming up on your 15th anniversary for um, trade rumors. You know, any do you have anything new coming up? Any any plans? Any changes? You know, new technologies? You know, anything uh, uh, on the horizon? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, a lot of the changes we make are incremental. Um, so um, what we're doing right now is, you know, we have um, transaction tracker on the website. And yeah, very nice. We tools of those na of that nature. And um, those were designed a very long time ago, I'd say more than 10 years ago. So um, a lot of them are not mobile friendly and um, kind of doesn't really have a slick interface at this point. So right. We're in the process of revamping those. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's certain things that I feel like we can um, introduce on the free website. And then we have a subscription service now that we started last summer. And so there's other things that, um, you know, kind of are, we're never going to be able to um, generate revenue. So they fit to me better as a um, part of the subscription service. So, right. Uh, one thing we just launched is uh, discussion forums. So, yeah, you know, it take, took a little while to set up and a little bit of effort to maintain and stuff, but um, it's kind of a cool feature to have a place where um, our subscribers can get together and kind of create a community. So that's probably a week old. And it's interesting to me to look in there and see which topics people are starting and are replying to. And, it, it, you know, in a sense, the discussion forum is very like 2005 in its own way. <laughs> And it really looks like it could be out of there. It's not like some kind of fancy looking thing, but it's like you know, the chat rooms. Yeah. Then that's the type of place I was promoting my websites on way back in the day. And yeah. it's kind of funny that you could still have that. Well, and, and I, if I've, I've been, you know, uh, uh, checking those out and I love when I, when I go on the mobile app and I'm, you know, I, I love to read through the comments and, and you, I mean, you've got some really uh, knowledgeable fans on there so you can get you can get some pretty good information just reading through the comments but then you get some that they're they're not the best you know they're they're a little rough you know so how do how do you police it you know how do, how do you keep it from getting you know it'll say out of control when you when you yeah get that's a good question um that's 
comment moderation has to be my least favorite part of being <laughs> um, the, uh, the the internet is just you know as you know home to so many different types of people and yeah. people say so many things online that they would never say in real life and so um we don't really try to put a lot of resources resources into comment moderation um you know i couldn't really afford to have an employee just looking at comments all day especially because comments are coming in 24 yeah. 7. i couldn't really watch them in real time so We've got a filter set up to, to filter out, of course, you know, the worst words that people might say. Right. We'll filter out also words that aren't exactly bad words, but that like a good example would be snowflake. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> just it's in a just general like sense, negative reactions. somebody calls another person a snowflake, it's not really a conversation that I feel like having on my website. And so yeah. like, you know, it'll trip, some of those words will trip it. Um, and then we allow people to flag comments. So, you know, if a comment gets flagged repeatedly, I'll see that. I, I review them every day, like the flagged comments. And then, um, you know, that's uh, that's kind of, and then we we also close comments and we've started to do that more. And it's unfortunate. I know that a lot of people don't like it. And um, it's an imperfect solution because right. it's kind of, a possible, a potential decent discussion is kind of spoiled by maybe a few people who just can't have, I think, um, you know, a civil discourse. Sure. But that is always how it goes when we have a post about domestic violence or COVID. Sure. Yeah. Like of course. literally, a hundred percent. We've never put up a post, left comments open on that topic, and not have it evolve <laughs> into something terrible. So yeah, which is awful. Which is awful. But it does happen. That's just the, I mean, it's just, I've just come to accept it. And, you know, people have asked me like, well, why, why don't you offer, you know, a forum for us to talk about this? I'm like, well, that's, I didn't start the website to hear your thoughts about like domestic violence, right. you know, especially some of the more vile things that people might say. So it's just not of interest to me. Um, on some of the other topics, you know, COVID, I'm, there, I'm sure there are intelligent discussions to be had, and some might have been potentially started, but I'm just like, you know, we got to put some of this stuff up there because we're trying to keep people informed of baseball news and these things dovetail with baseball, but um, we don't, I don't really quite want to um, host the discussion on a few of the more hot, bu hot button, less baseball-ish topics, so... Yeah, that's kind of the the place we've settled at. Yeah, and I think that's that's fair. That's fair. Let's keep it. Let's keep on, on baseball. <laughs> not always not, easy. Not everybody is happy with that, but not everybody is happy with them. <laughs> There's plenty of other places to go to talk about. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm, I'm like. You know, I'm not I'm not the government inhibiting your free speech. You can go talk about it to your friends. You can go on other websites, social media, anywhere. But this is a private company and. I want to post baseball chats. So All right. talk about yeah. baseball or don't. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, let's 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 talk a little baseball. Um, so did you have a favorite player growing up? Um, yeah, when I was really little, it was Jody Davis, the Cubs catcher. Oh, you never hear anybody say Jody Davis. That's a good that, one. That's a deep one. There's a famous story in my family. Um, I was, I assume, five or some age like that and i have an older brother who's um six years older than me so he was kind of he definitely sparked some of my baseball interest and he yeah. did baseball cards and watched and stuff and one night we were at dinner and he's and he's like kind of getting on my case he's like jody davis jody davis all you talk <laughs> about is jody davis do you even know any other baseball players and i sat there for a minute and i'm like Chili Davis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, my family still cites that story. Like the other, the only other player I, I could think of. Um, but yeah, like the, you know, it, it became, um, it became Ryan Sandberg, Mark Grace, yeah. Sammy Sosa, the usual suspects. And, and you know, I, I also kind of fell in love with um, Cubs that didn't pan out or were just okay. And, you know, I, I, I ran into um, 
I guess you might have to look this guy up, but Jim Bollinger. I don't know if you remember Jim Bollinger. Oh, yeah, I remember Jim, sure. I guess he's a baseball agent now, and I ran into him at the winter meetings, and I was, like, starstruck. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he, I think he just felt that it was weird, but it was so strange to me because he's kind of a distinctive-looking guy. Right. And, um, I, I just watched so many Jim Bollinger starts that just to um, run into him was, was odd. And I remember, like, Kevin Ory, Brant Brown, all these guys, they were just uh, – it was a big deal to me. And uh, my dad took me to the Cubs convention in 98. So I got to meet um, Jeff Blauser and Mickey Morandini and uh, yeah. some of those dudes. And uh, I, almost, I almost met Kerry Wood, but um, he ran out of time to give autographs. So it was, always, uh, it was always something that I was unhappy about. Well, it's not too late. Once this interview gets out there, look well, out. Well, I, I did, I did run it, you know. <laughs> I have, I don't know if you want me to share multiple Carrie Wood stories. <laughs> well, at least share one. All right. So the first one is, is so I, I waited in this line and this was 1998 and he had not yet pitched um, for the Cubs. Yeah. You know, he was just a highly touted rookie. And so I waited and I waited and with my dad, you know, at the opportunity cost of whatever other autograph we might've been able to get. And, um, you know, some of the players um, kind of finished the lineup Right. Even if their time went up. So there was maybe 30 of us in the line and Carrie just kind of up and went. <laughs> you know, Come on, Carrie. <laughs> but I guess I was like 15, 16. So I was not happy with him, but I still I still didn't give up on him. And so I had like this um, Carrie Wood baseball card. It was a Bowman baseball card and it was his rookie card. And when I bought it, it was probably worth like five or ten bucks. Yeah. And I used to mail cards to players with self-addressed stamped envelopes. Um, and asked for their autographs. And so I mailed it to Kerry Wood and then he blew up and had the 20 strikeout game and got you know, right. really, really popular after. I didn't see the card back and I kind of, um, I kind of gave up on it. And then I went off to college and I was visiting my parents years later. My mom hands me an envelope with my own handwriting on it. And I'm like, it's very strange to get an envelope with your own That's handwriting right. on it because I didn't have any remembrance of the whole thing. And I opened it up and the card was in their autograph and I still have it. And it turned the whole thing around on Kerry Woods. So I was like, okay, you know what? He worked through his mail that was two years old or whatever and, and sent me that card back. So good for Kerry. That's, yeah. a, that's a great story. Yeah, I know. It's fun. Because you know, it's not like he got six pieces of mail. <laughs> oh, I mean, he was probably getting like thousands and thousands of letters <laughs> and stuff. So it was really cool. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. My my guy growing up was always Joe Morgan. Um, cool. You know, mostly because of the stance, you know, the batting stance and the, the arm flap. And so I was always, uh, and he was a little guy, you know, mm -hmm. so I was, I was like, ah, oh, that's, I, I can relate to that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, he turned out to be this amazing player, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, he's a so, so we've got, uh, a few free agents left out there. You know, there's still some pretty good ones out there. Who would you say is is the best remaining free agent on the market? Um, I would maybe say, I'd probably say David Robertson, maybe. Um, yeah, that's a good one. In, in, good the, one. in the essence that, um, from what I understand, if he's, if he's holding showcases, he... He must be, you know, able to pitch in the majors after a certain ramp up period. And you would think that if it was just Tommy John and, you know, most guys are able to come all the way yeah. back from that these days, you would think he would be able to pitch in the back end of somebody's bullpen and be a useful uh, pitcher this year. You know, I was running through maybe Cole Hamels or Rick Porcello. Yeah. I feel like Hamels' health is somewhat in question. And I feel like Porcello is just kind of uh, the high floor, but there's really, there's not a lot of upside yeah. in, in throwing him in there. So those are kind of the ones I ran through. Don't you think, like, like for me, Robertson, I, I would have thought maybe Texas would have reached out, you know, because they've had so many uh, injuries. And, oh, yeah, there are some bullpens that are just terrible. And, yeah, and, you know, and, and, and the same thing, some of these teams like the Pirates and Tigers, you know, maybe a Porcello, you know, that can eat up some innings. That, that might not be too uh, – yeah, I've been talking. I've been talking. Uh, I was talking to uh, my employee uh, and coworker Steve Adams, and uh, yeah. we were we've been surprised that the the whole like sign a veteran 
decent player. Hope he has a decent first half and flip him. Yeah. Um, teams don't really seem to be doing that as much. Um, but you've had some some huge success stories. I mean, front of mind being Jake Arrieta for Scott yeah. Feldman. Um, you know, I don't know if, but you know, you could pick up Rick Porcello and he could spin a 3.75 ERA over a dozen starts, and maybe you don't get the next Arietta, but you can get somebody of value. Somebody. I, would, I would be trying that rather nothing. than I would be trying like guys that are terrible on a minor league deal. But yeah, teams don't really want to. I mean, I guess it's like they don't want to spend that extra five million bucks or you now that, that it might add up to. I guess. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I haven't really heard teams explain, like the Pirates explain why they choose to bring in like zero major league talent in an offseason. Yeah. Like it you are no still sense. a major league team. That's right. That's right. You still have fans. You, you still, I don't know. I don't think you're slashing ticket prices based on the quality of the team. So. That's right. I mean, I get kind of uh, Cole Hamels. I, I'm assuming something's not right or somebody would have taken a chance with him. I think that is the general assumption. If he had done a showcase and been vintage Cole Hamels, it'd be, you know, teams would be interested. You know, the, yeah. you know, Rich Hill was of interest and old old lefties are still interesting. Yeah, for sure. So so it, you, I'm assuming, have been watching a little bit of the uh, uh, spring training. Any Anybody surprising you or anybody that uh, is having a great spring that you think may uh, carry that into the season that maybe we didn't expect much from? Um, yeah, I'll watch it here and there. I've never been a huge spring training guy, but I'm certainly, uh, I'm always kind of attuned to, um, you know, uh, maybe less so the stats, but um, they've been citing kind of, um, surely if, if it's a guy who was hurt and you check his velocity, that's always interesting. And yeah. Then, the new one is um, if a guy establishes a new like maximum exit velocity, like hits a ball right. and for the first ever time, even if he does it one time in spring training, it might be meaningful. I think that's really cool. Um, but one that I've had an eye on would be James Paxton because um, from what I understand, his velocity is kind of back up to 94, 95, which is where it was when he was, you know, one of the better pitchers in, in, in the league. Right. And, um, I'm kind of curious too, uh, putting a guy like that in a six man rotation. Um, it could make a lot of sense. And even though he might make, I mean, maybe he, I mean, well, first of all, he never really makes 30 starts. So yeah. if the six man bumps him down to 25 and he does a healthy 25 with an extra day's rest, I think he could be pretty interesting. And, I, and I, so maybe that could be a guy to keep an eye on. Yeah. Plus he's back where he's comfortable. Yeah. He really wanted to be there and you know, I also think like when I think about these things from a fantasy standpoint, I'm like, well, I mean, obviously the Mariners don't want to run them into the ground, right. um, but it's not the same as like one of these like uh, highly touted prospects who are kind of babied. Um, yeah. he, he's a free agent after this or, you know, take a Drew Smiley or whatever. Um, if they're healthy, I think they're going to get run out there. I mean, the team would like to have them fresh for the playoffs. But other than that, I don't think that they're going to be like, um, managing their innings with kid gloves necess necessarily. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a really good point. Because why would you? You know, if yeah, if he has I mean, a big season, know, they're probably not going to resign him. So. Especially like a Smiley, you paid eleven million dollars, and if he's looking as good during the season that as he's looked, I think I think in that first spring training appearance, maybe he could give you one hundred and sixty innings, even though you know it's been a while since he's done that. Been a while, been a little while. Do you have a uh, you got a sleeper team? Um, let me think. Um, I mean, the, uh, I think the Royals are a fun sleeper. Um, yeah, they've had a good off season. I know, yeah. I mean, I, I like that they were active and you kind of wonder if, um, a couple of the young guys come up and surprise and, you know, something goes haywire with the White Sox or the Twins or the Indians or something. And suddenly, you know, they're looking more viable. And if their off season, off season is any indication, then you would think maybe they would go and make some kind of big move um, yeah. at the deadline and supplement, you know, whereas there's other teams that uh, are being so careful not to spend and being so mindful of the luxury tax, uh, you know, line or whatever. Um, those teams maybe wouldn't take a big plunge on somebody where perhaps a team like the Royals would, if they saw an opportunity, they might seize it. 
Yeah, that's that's a really good one. Do you think uh, Mondesi reaches potential this year? He's been um, teasing this for a while. I, I don't know. I think he kind of is what he is, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's good. Yeah. But I don't know if he's ever going to be great. They, You always hear he's always the one they kind of tout as he's the next big thing at shortstop. But Yeah, well, he, he also has to contend with Bobby Witt kind of coming up yeah. faster than we thought. I, I don't know if that'll help or hurt. Maybe it I know. I know. burns him on a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so what do you think about like when i was growing up you know you basically you, stats were what they were you know you had average you had rbis you know strikeouts wins you know none of those really mean what they used to you know what what's your thought on that are you a, a new stat guy or do you kind of kind of still look at the older stats yeah when i was um until the book moneyball came out I, I had no awareness of um, yeah. that there could be anything else. <laughs> just how baseball stats are. I didn't think about digging deeper, finding some hidden thing. Um, and I loved them. I mean, I did play fantasy baseball, and I still play fantasy baseball leagues that have RBIs and wins. And um, I, I absolutely am into the new stats. I yeah. look at them all the time, and I think they're cool. Um, I, I understand, you know, I've certainly talked to a lot of people and our readers and stuff, and I do understand why people don't want to have to learn about them. I definitely understand that. I guess it's kind of a matter of, are you looking at stats to have fun with it? In that case, pick whatever you want. Right. I, mean, <laughs> I think the reason that we look at RBIs in a fantasy league and we don't even try to evaluate the player's defense is because RBIs are fun and yeah. there, there's an special or the win. It's very unpredictable, but um, it's, you know, and it's why we would use an ERA instead of uh, some sort of uh, ERA estimators because what happened on the field and there was some luck involved and it's fun. Right. If you are trying to evaluate players and talk about contracts and make those types of um, decisions and, and commentary, then I think if you're not looking at the same things the teams are looking at, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're kind of trying to hold a discussion that's really not the actual discussion that's right. being held. And in fact, I think that the things that are available to us, the fan graphs and stuff, I assume that teams generally have things that are kind of another level up. And yeah. so, I mean, if you're going to be talking about RBIs in 2021, you're not even on the same wavelength as what right. you're evaluating. <laughs> and I mean, to be fair, I don't think too many fans are trying to evaluate players that simply. And I also respect criticism of new, newer stats that are not all they're cracked up to be. Right. And I, I, I love to find an opportunity to criticize war. Um, <laughs> I definitely cite it and I definitely look at it, but it's a pretty black box stat. Yeah. And it involves mashing together a ton of things and it involves some fairly arbitrary or subjective decisions feeding all of its inputs. And so for a guy to be 6.3 versus 5.7 war, it really doesn't have a lot of meaning it doesn't mean the 6.3 player was actually better. Um, certainly a high war player is much better than a low war player. And, it, you know, it, it's useful, um, but it's also got a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so if you were baseball commissioner for a day, what's the one thing that you would change to improve the game? Mm. Ah, that's a tough one. Um, I think, I think I, I think the thing I've read about recently that really piqued my interest. I think this was in the Ringer. They said um, I think there was kind of some momentum for moving the mound back, maybe a foot and a half. Um, yeah. You could almost picture a campaign around 62 feet. You know, um, I would want to think about. I would want to try to move the mound back. I think that would be the thing. Um, I read that article, I'd already kind of been looking around for like, what could you do that would 
increased contact in the game. Yeah. The right amount without like swinging the pendulum too far and without, from what I can tell, causing, you know, great injury to pitchers and, and it would um, probably in a sense hurt their pocketbook for a little while. <laughs> you know, if, um, if, uh, if, you know, hitters started to kind of take over, but um, we, you just have to cut down the strikeouts and you have to replace that not with walks, but with balls in play. So yeah, um, that, that, would, that would be, and, and you know, to their credit, they are very much wanting to do this. And, you know, and some of the things that they're going to be testing won't work and some will, but you can tell that baseball sees that, you know, the, the, the lack of contact and the length of the game as real problems. And, you know, I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's your feelings on, on shifting and, you know, whether we should be allowed to do that or, or do they stop? Um, I, I don't, I, that seems a little too, uh, too far with the meddling in my opinion. Um, it's like, you know, we've figured out where guys should stand. And so the only, you know, the only way around it is to, you know, legislate that they cannot stand in, in the, uh, place where they think the ball's going to go. Right. <laughs> like, um, that's kind of, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if batters can catch up with that. I mean, I assume it's not easy to just, you know, as a left-handed hitter, poke one down the third baseline or, or they would just do it all the time or a power hitter doesn't want to settle for a single or whatever the case. Um, but maybe over, over the course of a decade, um, maybe lefty hitters will, will start coming up with like put as a tool in their arsenal, you know, Hey, inside out that thing down third baseline, you're yeah. going to get a single like 90% of the time if you can pull it off. Um, so maybe there'll be some response to that and it'll knock down shifting a little bit, but, um, I don't think that that's, I don't think that trying to legislate that is really going to solve the problem. I don't think it's yeah. going to cause more balls in play. For example, it would cause more base hits but it wouldn't stop guys from striking. That's out. right. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it probably wouldn't increase the, uh, the balls in play. Yeah. It, it seems like we're, we're, we don't have those hitters. You know, when I was growing up, you had Rod Carew and Wade Boggs, Tony Gwynn, those guys that could really control the bat. And, and yeah. Like, you don't see the high contact. All day, it wouldn't matter. Lower power. You got, <laughs> the power is so rewarding and everything. So you don't see it. The other thing that I, and I definitely like that, um, I like the experiment of increasing the bakes the base size and trying to um, put some yeah. limits on pickoffs because stolen bases are awesome. And yeah. the fact that they've become, um, you know, in a sense, less valuable means that you should make them either, either easier to do or in some way more valuable because right. they're cool to see. Um, and Agreed. so, I mean, I, I think that they, I guess, change the distance between the bases by a matter of maybe an inch or two with, with the bigger bases and the minors, but, um, I mean, what if the bases were 88 feet apart? Um, yeah. I'm not really romantic about the 90, and I don't really care. And I think that if it would suddenly have guys stealing 40 bags left and right, because, you know, you got these guys, if you look at those sprint speed leaderboards, and they're going 30 feet per second, and they're flying, and it's like, man, it's such a waste. That guy can absolutely fly, but he yeah. steals five bases or 10 bases. And <laughs> it's like the math doesn't work. And it's like... Wouldn't it be cool if Acuna drew a walk and stole second and third, like almost automatically? Oh, yeah. He was like 50 50, or, you know, because he was like, had a really good chance to get in. And I just think it'd be cool. And um, I mean, I, we all, we grew up on Ricky Henderson. And That's right. 100 steal in a season, guys. And Tim Range, were, Ricky Henderson, the, those guys. You know, uh, those, yeah, those are just extinct. So, I mean, you know, imagine like, Imagine a Billy Hamilton getting on base and how exciting that he didn't get on base enough, but how exciting it was when he would get on base. Yeah. Imagine if more guys had, you know, Billy Hamilton. Oh, I like that one. I, 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 I miss the stolen base. Yeah. So I, 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 I encourage, you know, bringing it back. Of course, you know, we're all talking, we're talking about things that are all bad for pitchers. So there's yeah. going to be a whole class of players who would be kind of pretty mad about all this. Yeah. So, so I, a couple, a couple quick things before I let you go. Um, so I know you're, you're working through your, uh, fantasy baseball drafts and, and I, I don't want to screw you up, but do you got a, uh, a sleeper that you're targeting in the drafts? Um, you know, one guy that I keep finding myself getting is John Means. Um, 
He's a uh, WU uh, graduate. I oh, believe. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He, he's a guy who goes really late. And um, it's funny because when he made the All Star team a couple of years ago, it was that token um, we have to have an Oriole pick. Yeah. So I think a lot of people are like, well, this guy's like a number four starter. There's nothing more. And kind of wrote him off. But then in that little short season, from what I recall, I think his velocity ticked up. I think his last four or five starts, he, he kind of struck everybody out. He, he's always had really good control. And, um, and I, I mean, it's definitely true that pitching and, and you know, having to face the Yankees and, and the Blue Jays a lot is not ideal. But, um, you know, I mean, I could see a good year coming from him. And from where you, from where you have to take him in a draft, um you know it seems like a decent flyer yeah good good value yeah that's a, that's a, that's a really good one i we we definitely root for him because he's you know he, yeah, he's yeah. got a west virginia connection so we, uh, we don't have a lot him of now him. now that i have him on my team yeah <laughs> i love about fantasy suddenly i'm like a big john means fan <laughs> well, well tim this has been great so i've got one more thing for you and this this one's more a um on on the favor side because i want to play a little joke on on my fantasy league so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you this, this, so I'll tell you a quick story. So we've been playing, I told you before we got online, we've been playing for you know over 20 years, same league, basically 16 team league, basically the same owners the entire time, you know? So we've got one guy and his nickname is the ogre that he comes in last every year. It's, it's just a, a running joke, but he talks the most smack in the league. Right. <laughs> There's always that guy. There's always that guy. So he always talks the most smack, never fails. He comes, uh, comes in last. So, so I'm going to, I'm, we're going to, we're going to a little, a little pretend here. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say, Tim, you've been studying all the data for the dogs of war fantasy league. In your opinion, who's going to win the league this year? So then I just need you to say it's, it's the ogre's year. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. And then I, I, I'm going to ask you, to, so I'll give you that. So I, I'm going to ask you too, because it's going to kill him. Um, I'm going to say, well, who do you think is going to have, you know, the most difficult year? And you, you just got to say the panda. So the ogre panda. and the panda. Ogre's going to win. Panda's going to lose. Just because I, I'm going to enjoy the reactions I'm going to get from this. All right. So here we go. So, Tim, you have been studying the Dogs of War Fantasy League data. You've been running all the simulations. Who, in your opinion, is going to win this year? So, uh, you know, Mike, you know, you've, you've been showing me the info on this league. I've been crunching the numbers. Uh, I got the Ogre. I'm, I'm, an, I'm Team Ogre all the way. The guy's a beast. Um, I think he's due. I, I think that this is the Ogre's year. That's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting pick. Uh, That's you an know what? Pick. I, 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 I've been looking into it. Yeah. Hey, you got to go yeah. with the expert. You're the expert, so so yeah. you got to go with that. I am well, the expert so, on your fantasy league. Yeah. Do you do you think there's any particular team that might be having or might be in for a difficult year? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the pandas team jumped out at me. Uh, just just not a lot of talent. Um, yeah. Pitching just doesn't terrible. have I just I see a, a seller dweller there. Yeah, rough year for the panda. Nope. Yeah, he has no chance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just write him off. <laughs> well, well, Tim, thank you so much for uh, for doing this. This is a uh, this has been a great one for me. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I was really happy when you agreed to uh, to come. Yeah, out. thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. So before you go, I, I mean, obviously we know uh, MLB trade rumors. Um, any other sites that we could uh, keep an eye out for uh, for your work on? Yeah, certainly. We, so we have all four major sports. We have hoops rumors, pro football rumors, and pro hockey rumors. Um, and then we have a free app in the uh, Apple Store and the Android Store. It's called Trade Rumors. You yeah. can load up any combo of any of those four sports, any combo of teams and any combo of players, and you can kind of have a feed for each of those. Yeah. Um, it can be cross sport and you can get notifications for breaking news on any of that stuff. And that app is entirely free. So 
um, that's always a good entry point for our, for our stuff. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Tim. If you hold on uh, one second, I'll uh, I'll wrap us up. Well, that was just a blast. Tim, uh, obviously, very knowledgeable guy and very uh, smart, intelligent guy. What what a great um, solution to the fact that we are all looking, you know, for for up to date, quick baseball news. And he really filled uh, filled that niche. And we didn't go into to a lot uh, uh, of his background, but he's such a good writer. You know, he really does a good job uh, uh, with the articles and and writing about stuff. Great uh, insight. You know, I, I just I, I'm really admirer of uh, of the work that uh, that he's done. So if you haven't tried out any of the trade rumors, uh, please make sure you do because they absolutely give you the best, my opinion, coverage on all four sports. Baseball is my favorite, but all of them are just uh, excellent. And the new um, subscriber membership that uh, that they started offering not too long ago is terrific and it gives you a lot of uh, articles that uh, that you don't get on the normal site and definitely worth you know the little bit of money so uh, make sure you, that you uh, check that out so thank you guys for uh, listening this has been just a, a blast for me i hope uh, our baseball fans really uh, really enjoy this one um until next time bye everybody